Simon T. Bailey is a breakthrough strategist whose life's purpose is to teach one billion plus people how to be fearless and create their futures. He equips companies with the tools necessary to affect cultural transformation, resulting in higher employee engagement and platinum customer service experiences. He has more than 30 years experience in the hospitality industry, including serving as sales director for Disney Institute and has worked with more than 1,700 organizations in 46 countries. Simon has been named one of the top 25 people who will help you reach your business and life goals by Success Magazine, joining a list that includes Brene Brown, Tony Robbins, and Oprah Winfrey. He is the editor of nine books, and his building business relationships on lynda.com has been viewed by more than 850,000 people. His goal cast video released Father's Day 2018 has over 53 million views worldwide. Simon holds a master's degree from Faith Christian University and was inducted as an honorary member of the University of Central Florida Golden Key Honor Society. When he is not working, Simon spends quality time with his two active teenagers, roots for the Buffalo Bills, and serves as a board member for the U.S. Dream Academy, Orlando Health Foundation Board, and Florida Virtual School Foundation. Welcome to the Reading Circle microphones, none other than Mr. Simon T. Bailey. Again, Mr. Bailey, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good to be with you. Well, same here. Now, are you calling out of Florida? I am. I thought so. Okay, I remember reading the book, and I remember you talking about residing down in that area. So, okay, you, my usual question is, it's kind of like, where did this all begin? I mean, I, the, the writing of the books and everything, did you write in high school? Did you write in school, or as you, or did it come along later in life? Or how did, you, how did you get to where you are now? Where did it all start? Well, my father told me before he went home to be with the Lord that when I was eight years of age, that I used to tell both he and my mom that I was going to write books. And I don't remember this, but uh, fast-forwarding, about 20 years ago, my pastor said to me, uh, you weren't born to fit in, you were born to be brilliant. And when he said it, it unlocked something in me. I had never written a book before, and that started me down this whole process of trying to find my brilliance. So writing for me became therapeutic, and a released, and it released me into destiny. And that's interesting because a lot of times I have authors on the ear and they'll tell me, I don't consider myself an author. And I say, but you wrote a book. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that you, like you said, whenever you were small, you said you were going to write books, even though you don't remember it. And what came to my mind when you said that was the power of words. That, yes. But just by putting it out into the atmosphere, we have to be very careful of what we say, because a lot of times we really do get what we ask for. And the fact that you were saying that as a child, it actually came to pass. Absolutely. And book number 10 will be out next month. So when I look back at this whole journey, I'm literally living out the, the spoken word. Absolutely. Now, the book that I have, because I've actually I've read two, it might be three of your books, but I have Dare to be Brilliant. Uh -huh. And that's the one, whenever I was reading that one, I was like, I get in touch with him because you, you had so many nuggets there. Matter of fact, it's 31 insights and yep. you broke out each one of them for awesome life. So whenever you're working with folks, how do you how do you get them to to see it? Because like I said, I, I, I'm this is my kind of thing: the self improvement, the self development. But not everybody's there. Right, right. The first thing I I, I really want to understand is a person's story, because everyone is shaped by an experience, by a perspective, by an environment. So whoever has your ear has your life. So once I understand your story, I invite you to reframe where you have been, not to let go of your history, but to embrace your destiny by creating a new story, by understanding how you're wired. So are you a visual learner? Are you an auditory learner? Are you a hands-on learner? And then once I engage with you, I can begin to invite you to see, hear it, or, or touch it by understanding where you're going, just by dialogue, conversation. And I'm looking, I'm going back through, because I, I have the book downloaded on my Kindle, and I had so many highlights in there, I'm going back through them as we're talking. And one of the first ones out of insight number one was average people show up, brilliant people make a difference. Yes, yeah, every single day, average people, they punch in the clock. They're here, and they can't wait to 5 o'clock to come. 
But brilliant people, they look for opportunities to add value. So what happens is they don't chase promotions or chase money. Money and promotions chase them because they give a little something extra every single day. Yes, indeed. So, And, and it seems like more people, I mean, I guess where I'm going is we have a lot of of us have self-esteem issues or don't believe in ourselves or don't believe in anything for that matter. And a lot of times whenever those of us who are constantly uh, talking positive or trying to help people see the the light at the end of the tunnel or whatever, a lot of times they think, you know, that's okay, that's nice, that's fluff, that's poo-poo, that's hooey. I haven't found that to be. Absolutely. You are a product of your environment. So if you are in an environment that constantly feeds you a story, you buy into that story, and that story becomes a belief system. So what I'm challenging people to do is to change the channel on the television. Because when you change the channel on a television, you start to feed yourself a new story, and as you start to interpret the story that you're feeding yourself, then you will decree and declare life, not death. Absolutely. So, and you've made some major shifts and changes yourself because you were at Disney, but you decided to step out from that. Yeah, I was. I, I worked at Disney seven years, and I reached a place where I asked myself three questions. Number one, what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? Number two, what would I do if no one paid me to do it? And number three, what makes me come alive? And when I answered all three questions, I said, I want to speak, write, train, consult, and coach. And I would do these things if no one paid me to do them. So as a result of saying yes to my future and, and wanting to go after a more powerful reality, all of a sudden things just begin to open up. I, I said, I want to speak, write, train, consult, and coach. And I've been doing those things for the last 16 years. So I totally reinvented myself from what I was doing to create a new reality. Now, for a lot of people, that's difficult to do because we get complacent. We get, <laughs> uh, we, we get, you know, we get into our comfort zones and then, you know, we really don't want to move out. What do you tell somebody that's like they're on the borderline, they're on the fringe, they're teeter tottering, or they're kind of like, okay, I want to, but I'm scared to. When someone comes to you with that, how, how do you guide them? First thing is put a toe in the water. You don't have to quit what you're doing to go and do something else. Test it out. Beta test it. Try it out. See, take a, a week of vacation and go experience it. Or take a day off from work and go and try to experience the thing that you want to do eventually. What you may discover is like, you know what? I like certain aspects, but I don't like all of it. So for those who say, I can't make the full leap, test it out. The second thing is, why don't you find those who are already doing what you think you want to do and find out what were their lessons learned, what were their mistakes. If they had to do it all over again, what would they do differently? So before I became an author and consultant speaker, I went and interviewed all those who had went before me, from Zig Ziglar to Jim Rohn to Les Brown to Willie Jolly. And I talked to all of them, and I said, give me your best expertise, even George Frazier. And I said, what did you learn? And they began to impart their wisdom into me, because success leaves clues. Absolutely. And I see as we as I'm looking through Brilliant Living, 31 Insights to Creating an Awesome Life, you have a brilliant decree at the end of each yep. chapter. And I'm looking at when I am open to what wants to emerge in my life. I think clearly I am learning how to be totally present in the moment and to pay attention to everything around me. I am letting go of performance based relationships that take from me and never give again. Back to what we were talking about with the power of words. This is sort of like uh, an affirmation or, you know, again, speaking positive and in, into our spirits. Yes, absolutely. Because here's the whole thing. Language is the software of the mind. When we look at artificial intelligence, which everybody is talking about, robotics, uh, autonomous cars, automation, algorithms, sometimes people forget soul intelligence. Soul intelligence is programmed by language, verbal software. Verbal software are words. Words carry energy, and words that come out of your mouth create worlds. So if I want to live in a different world, I have to look at my words, which are the software 
that program my heart drive, my head drive, and my mind drive to move into the future. Now, you say you're on which number book you're on now? Book number 10. Book number 10. All right. I know... Uh, and, and some, whenever we have folks that have done multiples, a lot of times people ask, which is your favorite one? And I, I always remember <laughs> watching the movie about Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Whenever the reporter asks him, you know, out of all of your achievement and your accomplishments, which one is your favorite? And his response kind of like, well, you know, it's like your children. You really don't have a favorite. You love all of them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love all 10 of my children, even the one I'm giving birth to. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm a musician as well. As a matter of fact, I always tell the audience, and they've heard it zillions of times, <laughs> that the music that I play in the background and, and that's playing right now, that's my original music. I have two CDs that I've released. And people ask me a lot of times the same question. Well, which one's your favorite CD? Which one's your favorite song? And I, my response is kind of the same. I love all of them. Wow. They wow, each that's good. Uh, have their own reason for being developed and bring back the different memories of why they were named, what they were named. So, again, I'm coming back here again. I'm looking through to Unleash Your Inner Salmon. <laughs> your inner salmon let's talk a little bit about that because that's again i think a lot of a lot of us i mean because like you were the names you talked about zig ziglar and, and george frazier and, and tony robinson i've read mo if not all of this stuff as well as yours included and it's it really does help i mean i don't think people understand like what you're feeding into your spirit how much it does help you release yeah. What's interesting about the salmon is when they have the annual salmon run in the Pacific Northwest part of the United States, the salmon actually swims upstream back to its birthplace, its place where it was originally hatched. Somehow, what has neurologically been programmed in the salmon is to go against the stream. And there are those that are listening to us right now who are going with the flow because that's what they know. But in their spirit, there's something that is arising in them to be divergent and to go the opposite way. And I am telling you, when you go the opposite way, you come to an intersection of possibility that was waiting for you to show up and go against the grain. But nothing happens if you follow the crowd. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's funny you used to say that because it, it takes me back to my mother as a kid. That was the one thing she and my father constantly drummed into me and my sister was think for yourself. And in terms of like they are, if, if you saw a crowd, if you saw a fight going on, you better go the other way. Or you better go around it. We better not hear tell of you standing around watching a fight. They weren't big into following the crowd per se they were kind of like and i work in a school during the day and we're constantly trying to encourage children to be leaders and not just followers now i do understand to be a good leader you do have to be a good follower but exactly what you're saying in terms of being able to break out when that time comes yes absolutely and never settling for the status quo the most important thing people listening to us right now can do in the workplace is to think like an entrepreneur so how do I help this business be brilliant instead of average because I show up and I add value every single day? What would it be like to go to your boss and say, what can I take off your plate? What would it be like in your community to say, who can I help? Is it possible for me to help the least, the last, and the lost? Absolutely. It's interesting because I'm also reading, um, at this point, I was reading Simon Sinek's book about Start With Why. And I was yep. sharing that with my staff members at the school in terms of why drives the passion versus mm -hmm. what is kind of like, okay, that's what we do, but and that's relatively short term in comparison to the why, which is the passion. And that's kind of sounds like what you're talking about here, that folks really need to get that passion. Absolutely. But not only passion, people need to identify. And let me, let me tell you a story. So for years, I have two teenagers I've been asking them, what do they want to be when they grow up? Daniel's 19, Madison's 16. That is the wrong question. The question I should have been asking them, and I've gone back to them to apologize, and I'm asking them this question now, is what problem have you been created to solve? 
Wow. Because the world needs problem solvers. Correct. You can be passionate but not solving a problem. So you will be passionate by yourself. So everyone listening to us has got to say, what problem have I been created to solve in the 21st century? Absolutely. And there's, and that's the thing you just, because I sit here and just look back in terms of, and I'll be aging and dating myself whenever I do this, but just in terms of the the various technologies that have come about in my lifetime. I mean, when I came on the scene, 33 and a half and 45s was our mode of listening to music (laughs) and and radio and all that. And now, you know, I've progressed through the 33 and a half, 45s, cassette tapes, 8-track tapes, MP3s, digital, (laughs) I mean, all the way up the line. But I'm saying all that to say someone created that. And folks looked at it like, okay, how can we, I mean, I, I laugh whenever I think back to the number of songs I can get on my iPhone compared to carrying around that big box of eight track tapes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and someone mm-hmm. said, how can we make music more portable? And they worked mm-hmm. on that. And so to your point, we are working with kids who, who knows, they may be the one that finally comes up with the cure for all cancers. Right, 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 but exactly. That question you asked, though, is that's a whole different mindset from... What do you want to be when you grow up? Right, exactly. And that's the question we often ask kids. What do you want to be? But in the world that we're living in now, the world celebrates creativity and problem solving. So now we must begin to tell a generation, how do you begin to solve problems that will allow you to unleash your creative genius that's in you? And how do you take your ideas, your experience, and collaborate with others so each person adds a piece to the puzzle to come up with the solution that's needed in the world? Absolutely. And you just hit a key point in terms of the collaboration. See, this is why I struggle with folks are always focusing on or emphasizing differences as if they're negative Mm -hmm. versus Mm -hmm. looking at differences as something very positive. When everybody comes to the table with their part of it, you get a much better product than if you had one person or everybody doing the same. Exactly. Everybody brings their piece to the table. You know, what would a meal be like without the chicken, the rice, the the vegetables, everything that goes with it? It's the diversity of food that allows our palate to be satisfied and to feel like we have a full meal. You can't just have a, a meal with bread and water. <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> At least not one that's that's interesting and tasty. That's that's survival. But <laughs> you had so, you, 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 to start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking here now. I have pulled up all your books. I'm looking at shift your brilliance, release your brilliance, brilliant living, releasing leadership brilliance, success is an inside job. Mm-hmm. Brilliant service is the bottom line. The the vuja day moment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love to play on words. Simon yeah. says dream. And then we have the Greek philosophers Augustus. Meditate or meditate on now, your. Those are not mine. Those yeah, are not yours. Okay. Meditate on brilliant. Right. Yeah, meditating your personal brilliance. Meditating your professional brilliance. Okay, so there you go. And so I'm looking at them across the board there, and I see it's a lot, you, you know, I love the word that you're using, that word brilliant. I mean, it's like that constant, you're constantly staying with that theme. Mm-hmm. And, and we really do, I, I, again, I work in the school, so a lot of times when you're dealing with kids that are challenging, you'll get people calling them all kinds of names. And a lot of times, I, most of the time I call them angels or scholars. Mm-hmm. And people will look at me and say, well, why do you, you know, that, that, they don't, no, 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 you got to call them what you want them to be. They may not necessarily be right. there at this moment, but you have right. to keep seeing them and calling them what you expect them to be. And I'm noticing that's what you're doing with that word brilliant. Yes. In fact, everyone that's in my, my sessions that I teach, I call them a brilliant one. And I do that intentionally because I want you to raise the level of your consciousness that you are a brilliant one. And, and I'm going to speak to you as if you're a brilliant one until you rise to the occasion. Absolutely. That's what, you know, we tell the kids in the beginning of school. Now, look, you already have the A. You just have yes. to keep it. Right. Rather than right. starting from the bottom up, you have the A. Now, now and, and in some respects, that, that's more challenging <laughs> than to tell, like, okay, you're starting at the bottom and got to work at your top. You're already at the top. You have to keep it. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. 
So now, a lot of times I'm intrigued when I talk to folks such as yourself, when I read bios like I read of yours, and, and many of my guests are in that room. I always ask you, how, how did you get to where you were you with the Oprahs and the Tony Robbins and you're traveling the world in so many countries? How do you continue to network or, 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 or get that big break? You know, it's interesting because a video was posted of me almost 120 days ago telling a story about failure as a dad. And that video has now touched about 58 million people in 120 days. And so some would say that that was, you know, our breakout moment. I don't know if it's that. I think what really happened is when I got honest with myself right? and I dealt with my unfinished business and I became real and vulnerable and started to address some of the things in my own closet, just in the spirit of full transparency. And when I got really clear about that, then these doors of opportunity began to open, because what I recognize is not only did I have to do the work, but I had to continue to do the work. Correct. And doing the work is obviously starting with uh, a whole spiritual assessment. Where am I in my relationship with God? That's number one. Number two, how am I using my time, my energy, and my talent that he has given me? And then number three, how am I in relationship with those that are closest to me? Because it doesn't matter if you're a public success and a private failure. Right. So, so when we really got those areas right... And, and really begin to work on that. And God knows I am not there yet, but I'm, I'm certainly not where I used to be, as the old folks would say. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> new, new school don't know about the old That's school. Not, used That's to say. right. <laughs> I thank God that I'm not where I, what used, I used to, to be. <laughs> that I'm not where I ought to be, but I'm not where I used to be either. No, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's when I got really honest, that's when the breakout moment happened. And I noticed, like, as we were just laughing, how important is a sense of humor? Oh, my goodness. If you don't laugh, you know, the Bible talks about uh, laughter uh, being good medicine. Correct. And you have to laugh. I, I believe God has a sense of humor. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I do, too. <laughs> he really, really does. I say that quite frequently. I, I really, I see some things the way they kind of pan out, and I say God really does have a sense of humor. And you know, the other uh, adage or or cliche or saying is, you know, we have our plans, and then God looks at them and laughs. Right, <laughs> right, something right. Like, exactly. And I'm paraphrasing it, but I just think I, I'm one who loved to laugh as well, and I just think it is so important in terms of as you're doing whatever you're doing that one have a good time with it. I mean, nothing, um, you don't do anything well that you feel is drudgery. So yep. whatever it is that you're doing, you know, love it or leave it, one or the other. Don't need trying to put yourself through something that you know really is not doing anything for you in those areas that you just talked about, the spiritually, physically, relationship-wise, what have you. But yet we have, like I said earlier, folks get in that comfort zone and they'll stay miserable. Yes, they will. Absolutely. And they think that is what life is all about. And there is so much more for you. Everyone listening to us, there is so much more for you than what you have. How bad do you want it? And what are you willing to do to make it happen? And again, I'm looking at my highlights here where it's, there's a part in it where you said something, or you could be at the point of extreme dissatisfaction, distaste, or even disgust with the status quo. And see, again, yeah. we're talking about this notion of, I guess everybody gets to that point where they say enough is enough. But yes. why put yourself through that if that's the only thing or the only impetus for you to finally move? Why not move? Because I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back to you talking about leaving Disney. And I could, I, as I was reading your book, I could relate to that because I had worked for AT&T for like 15 years. This was back before Cell ever really took off. We were doing landlines and everything. I was in their marketing department. And when Simon, I, my job was great. I was meeting folks like you, uh, traveling around the country, traveling around the world, meeting all kinds of people. I was doing some training. I was doing, uh, I was in marketing. So we were doing the, the scripts for the telemarketing reps. And at one point I was in the international department where like, I was over at the Cannes Film Festival for 10 days doing a, a promotion there. <laughs> and so it was like, it was great, but I left it to come into education and people thought I was crazy. Mm. And they were like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You left the job with all those perks. You took a 50% pay cut to become mm. a teacher. I said, yes. Mm. And they, Why? Mm. 
because all the perks and everything else in the corporate life, it really wasn't doing anything for me. My heart had always been in teaching. And what happened was when I graduated, when I got ready to go to college, um, my father and I had this conversation and I wanted to major in either English or music. And he was like, "Mm, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't advise that because you're not going to make any money at it. You're either going to be a teacher or, you know, if you want to be a musician, you got to be somebody like a Michael Jackson or something like that. So why don't you pick something where you can make some money? So I majored in business administration. Mm -hmm. Majored in Mm -hmm. business administration, was hired by AT&T and did it for 15 years, but my heart was always in education. So when it got to that point 15 years later, I I turned left, 50% pay cut. But then after that, that's why I know what you're talking about is real because I've experienced it. Mm -hmm. After that, everything took off for me in education. I mean, the teacher did that for a few years and was promoted to principal really below the zone, as they call it in the military, uh, very quickly and have been principal for now probably close to 13 years or so out of my 18-year career uh, in education. But it does happen and it does work. And that's why I got so excited when I read your book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's awesome. But back to you, we were talking about what, like, relationship with God. When I made this transition, I always tell people, and based on our, my faith in God and everything, there are times, because you know God is there, but there are times whenever he is really seen, the hand is there. And when I made that move from corporate to education when i tell you simon everything lined up there's i always tell people there is no man that could have lined that up like that no human wow. being like wow. everything that needed to be in place was in place mm-hmm. i mean it was to the point wherein my off payroll date was august 30th of that year mm-hmm. of 2000 the beginning wow. date for me to start the Board of Education was September 1st. They told me mm-hmm. as of June 30th, your job for the next 60 days is to find a job. I already had mm-hmm. a job. <laughs> wow. So I ultimately wound up with my summer off paid knowing that I already had a job. But it was just things just fell in place from passing the teaching test to the whole everything. That I said that was nothing but God. Wow. Wow, and what and as they as they would say, won't he do it? Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of them won't he do it moments. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I share that, and and like I said, when I read your book and I saw how you transitioned from different things and how you got into, like you said, you know what? I want to public speak. I want to do this. I want to do that. You made it happen. God made it happen. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So for those in the listening audience, see, again, reading books or listening, because Simon is also on YouTube. He also has the training where he goes out personally. He has the book. We really have to immerse ourselves in material like this. Without a doubt, for those of us believers or Christians, the Bible is the way. But there are other tools that God has placed for us to also use. And, and when I read books like yours, Simon, that's what I look at them as. This is another resource God has provided us with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, you know, what's up next? I, yeah, you're on your, your 10th book now. What's, 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 give us a little preview there. So the 10th book, and, and you'll have to have me back on. So we'll oh, we will. So we'll give people a little, a little a sneak preview. But the book is called Be the Spark. Five Platinum Service Principles to Create Customers for Life. And what it is, is everybody is in the business of having a customer. And how do you become the spark, the stickiness of why they come back time and time again? That's number one. But number two, how do you just get a spark in your life again for loving who you are, loving where you are, and loving who you're becoming? Because when you become the spark, you light a fire. Every place you go, people say, whoa, what is going on? Because you found that inner spark. Right. And, and you know, and so, yeah, we're definitely going to uh, book you to come back on whenever that's released. Because we want to hear more about that for sure. I'm looking here again. I'm going, I'm bouncing back and forth between your current work and the work that you're working on and then just talking in general. But I'm looking here beginning at some of my highlights. It says... Here are three things you can do while in the midst of transition. One, listen for the still, small voice of God within your heart that is directing you and telling you where to go next. That voice may not tell you what you want to hear, but it will be the exact thing that you need to do. 
Talk a little bit about that. (laughs) One of the things, when I got ready to leave Disney, I cashed my entire 401k with significant Disney stock. I took out a line of credit on the house. And what I recognized, I was doing it at a time when the world would say, play it safe. Country was going to war with Iraq for the second time. Corporations were laying off by the hundreds of thousands. But the still small voice in me said it was time. And what I discovered is when you pay attention to that still small voice, you will never miss the timing of God. Right. Everything in life is about timing. The moment you walk into the grocery store, your, the minute your feet hit the sensors, the timing opens up those doors. So when you pay attention to the timing because you listen to the voice, you will never, ever be in a place that you're not supposed to be. You'll be there at the right place at the right time. And I know the answer is I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask it anyway in terms of because I said it earlier whenever folks had learned that I left corporate to go to education. What in terms of uh, those of us who worry about what other people say? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) You're worried about what other people say and other people really don't care about you because (laughs) people don't see you as you are. They see you as they are. And sometimes you can have a 50 by 60 dream, but you're listening to people that have 8 by 10. Right. So you have to shift away from them to move into the divine destiny that is awaiting for you. Absolutely. right. You know what I I tell people all the time whenever someone asks me that question, I say, well, this is what really happens. Think of yourself as a a photographer or either someone who loves photos or whatever. Whenever Mm -hmm. people come to you and they're complaining about what you do, you're messing up their picture. Mm-hmm. You're messing up mm-hmm. their photo. And so yeah. it's not that your photo is the one being messed up in terms of exactly what you just said. I'm just saying it in a different way. It's right, their right, photo that right. gets scrambled and right. they're struggling to handle that. Right. Exactly. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Focus for six. I'm looking at the various chapters here. Hack your leadership style, proactive feedback, a new era to be dynamic. Respect has no boundaries. Break your crutches. Ah, ha, ha. Talk a little bit about that. Break your crutches. Because I think that's back to what we were talking about, the complacency. But break your crutches. Yeah, sometimes we hold on to things because they've always worked for us. So, for instance, I was born in Buffalo, New York, third poorest city in America. Uh, Growing up in that zip code, 14215, that became a crutch because I say, look at me. I come from a very poor background. Am I supposed to succeed? I had to let go of that crutch. Then I went to Morehouse College but had to drop out of Morehouse because my parents couldn't pay. So now do I hold on to the crutch of being a college dropout or do I go back to college and finish even though it takes me 10 years, right? Then uh, leaving Atlanta, moving to Orlando, Florida, and not really having a lot of options. So each day I had to let go of mental crutches that would have crippled me for life. And when I let go of those crutches, I begin to find that I can walk on my own because the best hand that will feed you at the end of the day in any economy is the one at the end of your wrist. So how do I begin to break my crutches so that I can live a brilliant life? Absolutely. And I'm looking here at insight number 21. And this one is interesting to me, especially in the times that we're in now, because I'm beginning to think more and more people are moving the opposite direction. And they really think, number 21, kindness will impact your bottom line. They think that's being soft. (laughs) <laughs> like kind of like when you're kind to somebody I mean the other morning I had to, I had to, you know, had to laugh as I'm driving to work people are blowing their horns and yelling out the window and carrying on about each other and I sit there and I look at them and say I don't understand why people blow horns when they see a long line it's not going to make the line move any quicker but it's just like everybody seems to have this anger and this anxiety and this rushing frustration so when you whenever you know if you let somebody go i mean you're in the traffic and you kind of let somebody come in or everybody behind you gets crazy mm-hmm. so talk about this whole notion of because i'm right with you i i could not agree with that more in terms of ki- being kind because i honestly oh, again yeah. my experiences have been the kindness works so what i really believe kindness is actually one of the fruit of the spirit you right. know talk of the, there are nine fruits fruit of spirit kindness is one of them kindness is the ability 
to put aside having your way and extending yourself to someone else, not because of what you can get from them, but what you can give to them. Right. And in demonstrating that spirit of kindness, that's how people know that God is real, because your life might be the only Bible that people read. Correct. So if you are a person of kindness, you are demonstrating an attribute of God. Absolutely, because I'm looking at that brilliant decree. I am kind, I am caring and careful about how I treat everyone. I gladly help those who can do nothing for me. And that last line is key because this is not a quid pro quo. This is not, I'm doing this for you to do that. Right. I'm doing this. I don't know because this is the thing. And you know it and I know it in terms of what you do for the least that you may not get back from the least, but it comes back to you in another way. It does. It does. I'm setting things up for the grandchildren I don't have already. Correct. Right. But, but I'm setting up my seed for the future by what I'm doing today. So as I am watering and being kind to others and helping others who can do nothing for me, I'm setting something up in the future for my grandchildren to walk in a blessing that has been established by their grandfather, much like what Abraham did for the tribe of Israel. Absolutely. There's a young man that I met about a month ago, maybe only a month and a half ago now. He's His name is John Paul Gonzalez. I don't know if you heard him or not, but he was the one that's kind of credited for a few years ago when the Giants went to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. He gave a pep talk to them. And the way he got, he told his story of how he got there. It, it's And I won't go through the whole story there, but as it turns out, he and another friend of mine was doing some volunteer work at one of the rehab centers or either the youth centers where the kids go whenever they're like a detention center. And they were spending Saturdays there playing ball with the boys or this, that, and the other because they were in the detention center. It was like the youth jail or whatever. Long story short, he winds up now speaking with the Giants because of a kid who was in that facility that knew someone who worked for the Giants. Mm -hmm. And what he said was, what we were doing for the least of those when we thought no one was watching. Mm-hmm. And I told John, I said, you know, that really started me like what you did for when you thought no, I wasn't doing it for attention. I wasn't doing it for any, I wasn't doing it other than I wanted to help make life better for these boys. And as a result of that, he won. Now he's affiliated with the Giants. He goes to all the games. He's standing on the sideline because he gives them a pep talk the night before the game. So forth and so on. But he's a teacher in Union City, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Wow. But wow. he said that okay, it all came about because people were asking, well, how, you know, because he even he thought it, he said, I thought it was a fluke when they called me and said, would you come? He said, what do you mean you want me to come speak to the Giants? This is a joke, right? You're pranking me. <laughs> and but no, it turned out it was for real. And because a kid that was in that detention center knew somebody who or they said, get him. He's very good. And that was back to the question I was asking you earlier. I'm sure that's how as word of mouth goes about as you go about just like I read your book and got in touch with you. That's how that's how you get known. That's how people are, are knowing, learning about Simon T. Bailey. That's why I write books, because they will go to places I will never go, and they will touch people I may never meet. And if that's all that I do, then I've put a seed into the soil of a person's heart that's going to produce a harvest. I notice again that you break your book out by each each decree, if you will, or each chapter, however you want to call it, breaks out with spiritual, mm-hmm. and you go into the, you know, the various... Each, how it relates. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I do that because many years ago I was sharing the stage with the late, great Stephen Covey, who wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Right. And he said, he, he said something I'd never heard. He said, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spirit beings having a human experience. Now, that might not be Bible or theology, but it makes logical sense. Correct. That we are a spirit being. And so I always start with a spiritual piece, because that's the foundation and the core of who we are. I mean, without God, we're nothing. Without God, we, we would fail. As the old folks would say, without right. God, we would be like a ship without, without a sail. Without a sail, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know, and we got them, because <laughs> those of us are there. You're absolutely right. And I'm looking at, again, another, this is another one that I truly believe. It. it says, celebrate the crumbs. Yes, yes. I believe life is all about taking the crumbs of our history and our story and our failures and our successes, and those crumbs lead us to the bakery of opportunity. 
But before we get to the bakery, we have to make bread with the crumbs. And when we begin to embrace all of the crumbs, we discover that the bakery was always there. But sometimes we never get to the bakery because we never eat the bread that are made up of the crumbs of life. Absolutely. And it's, you know, before you, you know, we got on the air, one of the songs I was playing was Hezekiah Walker's Grateful. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, it was three or four songs that came on in that whole thankful, grateful thing. That's another thing, just like with kindness, I don't think enough of us, because I know there is a lot of us, but I'm not sure if still enough of us don't understand the power of thank you. Oh my goodness, the power of a thank you is so amazing. Because not only does it show gratefulness and gratitude, but it shows a spirit of love, uh, a, a spirit of that I am so forever thankful that I have this moment. You know, it's, it's profound. It really is. And, and my pastor always says, and it's funny, he said, I don't use the word hate often. He said, but I can honestly tell you, I hate an ingrate. <laughs> I hate you know, the, like the ingratitude of somebody that's just not grateful at all. He said that I that he, he struggles with. He said I struggle with with the, with the ingrates. <laughs> and <laughs> but but <laughs> thankfulness is is powerful. Just for so like for me again working with the kids at the school when I get a child come to me and say thank you, I almost cry. I mean, I I have to almost like turn around for the kid not to see me begin to well up, but just the way they say it or the sincerity of it. Mm-hmm. of realizing mm-hmm. that you didn't have to do this for me. Mm-hmm. And I am grateful that you did. Yes. And, yep. Absolutely. And so that's the power. And the other piece of it is being able, to, like when you say celebrating the crumbs, but being able to celebrate when somebody else is getting what you think you ought to have or, or they get <laughs> ahead of you. You can still celebrate for somebody else for their good fortune or their good blessings or, or what have you without becoming jealous of it. Yeah, what you bless, you attract. Correct. Because the moment you become uh, jealous of what somebody else says or has, you reject it out of your own life. So when I see good things happening for others, I know that my season is around the corner. Correct. I begin to bless and celebrate and say, that is amazing. I'm so glad it happened for you because if I could see it happening for you, I can see it happening for me because he's no respect of person. That's absolutely right. We had a uh, guest preacher back in June for Women's Day, and she was preaching about a Mary and Elizabeth. And she had brought some insights that I had not thought of in terms of how Elizabeth could have gotten jealous of Mary, even though they were cousins, they were family. But Elizabeth had been trying to conceive for a long time, and she didn't conceive till she was old. Mm-hmm. Mary had conceived when she was young and was carrying Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so she was mm-hmm. bringing the point that Elizabeth could have been real catty and real nasty, but she wasn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She was just as happy for Mary as if it had been her. Mm. And, mm. She, and she had no problem with playing uh, second fiddle because she was carrying the cousin. She was carrying John. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. yes. mm-hmm. but she said, yeah. you know, Elizabeth didn't say, well, why wasn't that me? Why didn't God do that for me? She's young. Right. She, uh, I wanted that. But, I, you know, again, we have to be able to celebrate for others. And like yeah. you just said, what you celebrate and bless eventually comes to you. We have a situation now. Um, <laughs> and this is why I'm telling you how I connected with you so well, because a lot of similarities and, and, and viewpoints. I'm the principal of a school, and there's two schools right beside each other. And the prince, the school next to me, I had led that for two years before they moved me to the school next door. And the school next door is an extremely challenging school. And part of my mission and purpose, I believe, is to help turn it around. It's been, it's been a long journey, and we go back and forth. But the school next to me that I had led, and the same vice principal who was my vice principal, we, they, they moved her up to principal. They've become a blue ribbon school. So it's kind of like they're one of the best schools in the state, right next door to one of the failing schools in the state. And I'm happy for her, because I know her well, and I'm happy for her, I'm happy for the school. And people are looking at me like, well, you were there, aren't you, aren't you mad, or aren't you, aren't you jealous because it wasn't you? I'm like, no. Mm-hmm. Because eventually it's going to be us. Mm, wow. And so, but it's, 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 I mean, like these principles that you're writing about, I mean, they are real. And I think our challenge and purpose is that to, to help people understand how it all connects. Totally. And, Absolutely. And, right. And, the, and, and how life really can, it's not going to be perfect, but life really can be better if you start 
shifting that mindset. It's like you said, shift your brilliance. Mm-hmm. If you start mm-hmm. making those shifts, you will begin to see things change. And it's just that a lot of I think there's so much negativity that we're constantly facing that for those of us that are really trying to get that positive message out there that we just, you know, back to that, the harvest is plenty, the labor is a few. <laughs> uh, yeah. We just have yeah. to keep going. We have to keep. Absolutely. <laughs> Keep it out there. But I, you know, again, I am so glad that you had the opportunity to be with me and you took the time. I'm thankful and grateful because truth be told, you're doing what ultimately because people ask me, well, do you want to be superintendent? I said, no, that's not really where I'm headed. <laughs> I'm kind of going down that same track you're going. You know, I want to do the public speaking, the training, the life coaching, so forth and so on. So I said, when I'm done principaling, that's where I'm headed. <laughs> so when I look at you, I said, all right, I got a model there. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely, for sure, for sure. But it has been uh, a pleasure speaking with you. And again, I take it out of your busy schedule to join us this morning. Uh, what I do when I get down to the last few minutes of the interview, I always shut the mic off and I be quiet and I allow the guests to promote, let folks know how they can get in touch with you, websites, books, to book you, to, to come out to their event or what have you. You can say everything with the exception of a dollar amount, but anything short of that, I'm going to turn the mic off and you can promote away. Okay. Well, certainly you can find out more information by going to Simon T. Bailey, T for terrific, Bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y dot com. You can sign up for our newsletter there. It's free. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram at Simon T. Bailey, Facebook, Simon T. Bailey, LinkedIn, Simon T. Bailey. And we're getting ready to do a webinar uh, on the 15th and 16th of October. It's a free webinar where I'm going to teach individuals how did I transition out of corporate America uh, to build the speaking, writing, consulting, coaching business. And uh, so we're going to really kind of pull back the curtain and really teach individuals why speaking is the new marketing. And uh, so you can get all of our books on Amazon.com. You can get them in uh, three different forms, electronic, printed, as well as audio uh, at audible.com. And I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much for allowing us to serve you this morning. Well, thank you for willing to, to serve. And I am, like I said, whenever I first started, I was trying to make sure the recording equipment was working because I do record the shows and I, I put them up on my YouTube channel. Uh, I email you a copy of the MP3 link and the YouTube uh, you know, link as well. And you're free to do however you want to share it, wherever you, whoever you want to send it to or put it on your site. Whatever you want to do with it, they're yours. It's not like I put a restriction on you. And so whenever I get that edited down and I'll, I'll email that out to you or either send it to your sister. Thank her, by the way. I'm trying to think of her name. because we, Melissa. Yes. Melissa, yes. We did go back and forth a couple of times. I think I called and left her a message at one point. Um, but thank yes. her for coordinating this. And I will get the links over to you. But again, folks, it is Simon T. Bell. I see you are August, baby. That's another thing we have in common. Because I'm August 17th. <laughs> When's your birthday? August 17th. <laughs> And I'm August 26th. Uh-huh. Hey, God is good. Yes, he is. <laughs> yes, he is. I, my, again, my pastor was born in September. And, and Simon, when I tell you he makes a big deal about the month of September, I mean, we'll be hearing, now, this is October like 5th or 6th, we'll be hearing from now, tomorrow. He'll be talking about next September. <laughs> and so he says September is, about, is the month God. Like, no, no, no. We already talk, August is the month. <laughs> <laughs> so August is the month God loves for yes, sure. Yes. Well, I tell you what, you have a wonderfully blessed week, day, life. Uh, you know, just as my mother can say, keep on keeping on, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Blessings to you. Thank you. Same to you. Take care okay. now. Bye-bye. All right, bye now. <laughs> 